So we've got uh, what's a vertebrate. Now we're going to really uh, focus in on the different lineages of, of vertebrates. How do they go on? How do they uh, radially evolve? How do they fill all these different niches across the world? We're going to start basically at the bottom, the most um, basal of the groups, and that's going to be the xylostomes, hagfish and lampreys. This, the xylostome, this is the hagfish, they're kind of cool, they do not have a vertebral column. They entirely lack vertebrae. But they're still considered vertebrates because there's a lot of evidence that says at one point they had it, but then, through evolution, they lost it. So it's sort of like they had it for a while and then it went away. And that's because these guys really, they need to be extraordinarily flexible, much more so than any other type of organism. Uh, they tie themselves in knots as a, um, as a strategy for hunting. What they, end up do, what they do is basically they chase an organism down a hole at the bottom of the sea. Then they grab the organism with their jaws, they tie their tail in a knot, and then they push the knot backwards so it leverages against the sand to pull the fish out of the sand with them. They also use it because they secrete an enormous amount of slime. Uh, that slime is there in order to protect the organism. It's, it's not delicious. It's, it's disgusting. It gums up the gills of organisms trying to eat it. There is nothing that we know of that actively preys on the hagfish because of the slime. To, uh, the problem with the slime is it also fills up all of its holes. Its nostrils get filled, its um, gills get covered in it, and it can't breathe. So to get the slime off, it ties itself in a knot and then runs the knot the length of its body, and it's basically like squeegeeing off its body with, uh, to get the slime off. So yeah, the, the, this is the knot that it ties itself in in order to get that, um, the, the mucus off. Oh, and I forgot. In order to get rid of the slime that went into its nostrils, it sneezes violently underwater. Because you guys know, when you sneeze, stuff comes out. All right, next up we got our nathostomes. Um, nathostomes are going to be uh, the jawed fish. Um, basically, and this sort of sums it up, they were, they were terrors of the ocean. They were, um, at one point, the super predators of the sea. Sharks didn't hold a, like a candle to these guys. Um, what you see in front of you is Dunkleosteus. Dunkleosteus was a nathostome that basically its bone teeth between that and its jaw force has been calculated at being able to uh, literally slice through steel. Um, pretty nasty guys. And I appreciate it. This is a quote from my daughter from when she was younger. Uh, we got teeth and then we ate everything that was in front of us. That's what happens when you can do things and the stuff, you can, the stuff around you can't. You eat them. Um, and that was really the philosophy of these fish. They would eat everything, um, including each other. The chondrichthys, uh, the sharks, skates, rays, they all have a flexible skeleton made of cartilage. Osteichthys, these are going to be fish that have bony skeletons. This is the lionfish, it's an invasive species. Um, and we have decided that, honestly, our best way of dealing with it is to declare it to be a delicacy and hunt it. That is quite literally the way we've decided to deal with the invasive species, is let's just eat it to death. It works. Let's do it. Then we end up with our tetrapods. Tetrapods are probably the organisms you are most familiar with. These are the last three classes of amphibia, reptilia, and mammalia. All of them have four distinct limbs. I know you're thinking to yourself, because I don't know how many students have told me, but birds only have two feet. Yes, and wings. That counts as limbs. Um, so we're going to go into depth on all of the different tetrapods. We're going to talk a lot in this particular lecture about amphibia and reptilia, and then um, I'm going to give you a whole separate lecture on just mammalia, because it's very, very widely diverse. So first off, we've got our amphibians. Uh, they, in general, live on land, but they must return to the sea in order to reproduce. Uh, this is the, I want to say this is the terror frog. Um, basically, the, oh, the, or the terror, the hairy terror frog. Um, its defense mechanism is very unique. What it does is it will literally break its bones in order to um, project a, a compound fracture out of its skin to attack its enemies. 
That is insane to me. They do regenerate. So after um, it's pushed its own bone out of its skin, it's able to uh, basically straighten its, um, its arm, puts the bone back in its skin, and then over time it will heal. So it would be <laughs> basically the equivalent to you. Nobody would mess with you if they're trying to mug you and you had this defense. Seriously, they're like, you know, I got a gun. You're like, yeah, well, I've got psh, a bone shard. And if you break your own bones, they're not going to mess with you. You are crazy at that point. Frogs are one of the groups of amphibians. Um, this is uh, one particular frog. This is the, uh, one of the painted frogs of the Amazon rainforest. Uh, in recent years, we have found a painkiller that is 200 times more potent than morphine in the secretions. <coughs> Excuse me. In the secretions of this frog. Uh, 200 times more potent. You guys know, anybody ever had morphine before? It's some pretty heavy stuff. 200 times more powerful. It will kill you. It will stop your heart. You will die. Don't lick the frog. Toads. Fun story about toads. If you ever said, now there's a difference between frogs and toads. Toads are much more terrestrial than frogs. Um, toads clean their mouths off after they eat. So I can imagine that this is just, you know, you sit there and watch a frog and they like, they swallow a fly and they're like, oh yes, that was very good. Um, clean themselves up. Salamanders. Uh, salamanders shed their tails in order to escape predators. Literally, their tails will grow back. Um, it is a big, meaty portion that the predator typically will appreciate eating as the salamander escapes. That also will trick the predator because uh, there's still a lot of nerves in that tail, so once the, nail pop, the tail pops off, it keeps moving. So the predator is attracted to that high-movement tail. Uh, so it confuses it, uh, lets it keep moving. There are giant salamanders. Um, huge salamanders. We're talking salamanders that... Oh, do I have a picture? No, I don't. We have salamanders that are basically the... Um, you could pick it up and hold it like a baby. Um, you, you've got... Uh, basically, you wrap your arm around it. Okay, not a baby. A toddler. Uh, its head pops up like this. You put it in a little one of those, uh, those baby Bjorns. Um, and its tail just basically hits the floor. Salamanders can get big. Cassilians are hilarious to me. Doesn't it look like a sock puppet? I mean, it totally looks like a sock puppet. They were, um, uh, I think, very, very recently discovered. So these amphibians have no lungs. They require um, water to run across them uh, in order to oxygenate them. They get their, uh, their oxygen through diffusion. So <clears throat> they discovered this in... Um, where did they discover it? It was in, I want to say it was in the Amazon. Yeah, it was in the Amazon. And they thought, okay, cool. It's got to be with running water, and the water needs to be cold, because cold water has a lot more oxygen, and running water allows that oxygen to um, keep, uh, new oxygen to keep coming in. Makes sense. So they were looking for it in cold, fast-moving water. Well, they found where it actually lives is in um, warm, low-lying rivers that don't have terribly much water movement. It made no sense whatsoever, but it happens. Also, again, sock puppet. Love it. Right. We got our reptiles. Reptiles have adapted to live on land, much more so than amphibians. Amphibians are still tied to the seas, uh, tied to water. Reptiles, not so much, and it all came down to their egg. Uh, reptiles have desiccation-resistant skin, that is, their scales prevent water from leaving. Thoracic breathing. They have muscles in their body that pull air in instead of requiring um, passive exchange through uh, moist skin. They have water-conserving kidneys, just like you, and internal fertilization for that egg. Yes? What is desiccation? Resistant? Desiccation means that you're, you're resistant to drying out. So, desiccation-resistant skin is resistant to gases leaving or coming in and water leaving or coming in. It's just like with plants, right? We talked a lot about plants, how they have this internal conductive tissue and this outside that has an epidermal layer. So do reptiles. That's what those scales are for. Um, it's not so much for protection as much as keep all of the water inside. They have thoracic breathing. 
These are muscle contractions of the rib cage, just like you. When you um, take a deep breath, your diaphragm goes down, your uh, rib cage expands, air is drawn into the lungs. It's not the lungs themselves that are doing the work, it's the muscles around the, the lungs. Yeah? Are there muscles on the lungs? No, it's the muscles you, around the, the muscles on the ribs? You can get bruised, it hurts. Um, not nearly as much as the, that diaphragm is doing most of the work. Okay. Um, you've got kidneys. Kidneys are used to concentrate waste into urine. Just like we saw in, we saw in grasshoppers, and I expect you to remember it. Um, grasshoppers are going to just, uh, they, they conserve water. What these guys do is just like you, you're going to um, filter um, your blood and your uh, waste products out of the blood into... Uh, your kidneys, they're going to concentrate into uric acid, which then goes down to your bladder and it gets super highly concentrated, which you then excrete. It means that you're not constantly letting out a stream of um, water, urine. And then the big trick was internal fertilization. Um, this is what really allowed reptiles to leave the seas, is that you've got fertilization doesn't occur externally, you don't need water for that external fertilization. The eggs, uh, so you, you uh, fertilize internally and then the shell grows around the egg. That was critical because that shell is water resistant. So when you lay an egg on land, it doesn't dry out. You guys ever seen two snakes mating? Yeah, it's the creepiest thing you'll ever see in your life. Um, I am terrified of snakes, just so you know. I don't know why. I like. And I'm getting over it as I get older, but I think it's just the sudden appearance of a snake will freak me out. If I see it, I'm fine. If it's, I'm about to step on it, then I'm like, do the whole like dance thing backwards. Um, I was walking with my wife when we had just recently had our first kid. And we were walking in the woods around the lake. And it was, must have just been the right time of year. Because sure enough, I saw one snake cross the path right in front of us. Um, and I was like, whoa. Okay, well, you know, what are the odds? Then, about 50 yards down, I saw two snakes. Um, and I was like, okay, it's time to go home now. And then, what set me off to the end was um, what's called a mating ball came rolling down the hill. Three or four snakes, all in a cluster, trying to mate with each other, was rolling down the hill at us. And it was at that point where I just lost it. And I was like, okay, look, we're going home now. I'm going to keep my eyes closed. You just guide me and the small child out of here. Um, it is not a fun thing to see. Conversely, watching turtles mates is hilarious. They just look so, so intense. Hmm? They squeak like crazy. So I'm thinking of turtles. Um, you've got aquatic turtles and you've got terrestrial turtles, right? Aquatic turtles don't breathe underwater. But what they do do is, is what they do do, is um, they have this thing called a, um, a cloacal area. It's this, this flap of skin right around their head. You guys know what I'm talking about? You look at a turtle, you see it's got this like, really wrinkly skin. What that's there is it allows for some um, movement of oxygen, some diffusion of oxygen across that, that surface. So you've got desiccation-resistant shell, but that cloaca, it can get wet and allow for gas exchange. That's not terribly important during the summer, but during winter, these organisms, these aquatic turtles, can actually live underwater. Uh, they go into a state of torpor, so basically their body slows way, way down, minimal levels to survive, and it only uses the oxygen through that diffusion. That lets them stay underwater all winter long. Cool. Uh, what kind of turtle is that? That's a snapper, isn't it? Don't mess with snapping turtles. Sidebar, don't mess with snapping turtles. They will mess you up. Um, I, there was this one time I was trying to, I, I was driving along and I saw probably a two and a half foot snapping turtle crossing the road. You guys know, you've seen big turtles like that? Um, so I'm like, oh, this is bad. It shouldn't be in the road. So I get out, of the, I stop the car. I'm like, how can I help this guy get across the road so he doesn't die? Um, 
Well, I can't get close to him because his bite force will shear off fingers. Like, no problem. Um, and they can actually bite all the way back to their tail. Um, you're not terribly safe just, like, if you pick it up along the sides, it can, get, it, it can snap you there. Okay? Um, the way you have to pick it up is, like this gentleman is doing, it can't get you right behind the back of the, back of the head and back of the uh, total back of the shell. But I'm not going to risk that. I mean, it's a turtle. It's cool. I'm trying to get it across the road. But I'm not going to risk my fingers. So I'm like, how can I get it across? I tried to lure it onto a piece of cardboard to drag the cardboard across. Because you can't just gra- if you grab it by the tail, it could break the tail. And then the animal can't survive that. It's basically paralyzed. Uh, part of it gets paralyzed at that point. Um, so I'm trying to work it out, and trying to work it out for like 10 minutes, and then this large truck comes along. And very, very slowly, what, looking at me while I, he does it, runs right over the turtle and kills it. And it was the worst sight I've ever seen, because its head was just like, ah, you know, big mouth, big eyes. I was like, what the hell's wrong with that dude? Yeah, at that point I gave up. Can't do much after that. Snakes, awesome, right? Um, thought there's so many different types of snakes. Snakes, obviously, uh, they had four limbs at one point. They were tetrapods, but those limbs have retracted. They still have hips. They still have um, places where limbs go, but they have shrunken so much that they're uh, vestigial. There are three types of uh, poisonous snakes in the Commonwealth: the northern copperhead, the eastern cottonmouth, and the timber rattlesnake. I assume that most of you have seen at least one of these in your life. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you the number of copperheads that live in my neighborhood, just not near my house. And it sucks, but do you know why they don't live near my house? No, because I have a whole bunch of black snakes living near my house, and black snakes hunt copperheads. And that's the only reason I'm not, like, freaking out about the black... I do freak out when I see the black snakes, but I'm like, but at least I know they're not copperheads. They hunt copperheads actively. So if you see a black snake in your house, don't kill it. It's, it's doing you a favor. Timber rattlesnakes, yeah, call somebody to take care of that. Lizards. Lizards are cool, but I want to talk about the Komodo dragon, the monitor lizards. The Komodo dragon is about 10 feet long. Um, it follows its prey's, uh, typically it learns the prey, its prey's travel routes. It'll hang out near um, watering holes, and it'll wait to ambush them. So it figures out where you're coming from, and then lashes out um, while, while the organism's walking by. Now, once it's bit, the lizard pulls back. It doesn't keep attacking. Because in its mouth are a whole bunch of bacteria that produce a lot of toxins. Basically, it bites you in order to puncture the skin, so the bacteria get in there to weaken you. Then, over the next several days, it will follow you until you die. Then it eats you. One bite, waits for death, and then it takes care of the, uh, then it eats the organism. It does maybe not when you're dead, maybe when you're almost dead. So I thought that was kind of a cool tactic. The crocodilians, so alligators and crocodiles, um, they are very capable of, very, of short bursts of speed. They can exceed 30 miles an hour, so they can move very, very quickly over a short distance. Um, they may look slow, but they're not. Um, so, you know, it, it's not really run. It's more of a, like a, a lunge, but it can lunge 30 feet, so don't mess with these guys. Um, anybody ever seen an alligator or crocodile? Yeah, you, you might be seeing them sooner than later. Uh, because, do you know what the northernmost range of the American alligator is? No? Norfolk. Right. So, uh, and, and with climate change, expect that range to go higher. You see them coming up on the beaches in, uh, at Virginia Beach sometimes. I know, stuff you don't really hear about. Uh, recent, not recently, probably about three years ago, there was one in, um, Mecklenburg? No, not Mecklenburg. Right around here, in a uh, uh, drainage ditch. But people think that may not have been a natural migration. It may have been an, uh, a released pet. Uh, oh, I'll tell you a fun alligator story. Um, 
This is back from when I was younger. Actually, about 20 years ago. So I was just getting ready to get married. Um, I was meeting my fiance's grandmother for the first time, who lives in Florida, like all grandmothers do, apparently. Um, and she lives right on the lake. She's, you know, she's older. Her, her grandfather's around at the time, too. And she had a little yappy dog. And this is not, like, this is not a tiny dog that, you know, that they sort of, like, prance. This is a, a yappy dog that's, you know, about two feet long and foot high. So decent-sized dog. She really loved this dog. Well, one day, she, um, she was getting ready to take it outside, and it sprinted out the door down where the lake is that's filled with alligators. She goes after it, and it's like, you know, calling after it, but she's shuffling along because she, she's old. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to save this dog. I'm going to get this dog back, and it's going to, um, then I'm going to be cemented, and I'm going to be allowed to marry the girl. Um, so I put on my shoes, and she's still shuffling after the dog. She makes it about, you know, all the way down her driveway. Um, I take off running. Uh, I pass my wife's grandfather, who's a heavy smoker. He got a little bit farther before he's like, <gasps> you know, because lungs don't work. Um, I'm chasing this dog. Turns out, I don't know dogs well. What happens when you chase a dog? It runs yeah, it runs faster. That sucked. So then I think, I'm going to cut this dog off. I'm going to run down the street side of it, and I'm going to come along in front of it. So it's running along the street. I come running, you know, past. It's, you know, peeing and stuff like dogs do. And I'm catching up to this dog, and it sees me. And it's like, great, we're playing. And it runs straight for the lake. So I go chasing after the dog. I'm like, no, don't go in the lake. The dog bounces, runs down a pier, jumps on a boat, jumps on the boat next to it, and then apparently thought there was a, a boat beyond that, went right into the lake. So then I get down to the lake and I'm thinking, well, right, natural selection. I was like, there's, there are alligators in this lake and I know there are alligators in this lake. And there's a dog swimming there. The dog's trying to make it to um, swimming back because the dog realizes it made a mistake. But the embankment is four feet off the, um, the water because you don't want alligators to get up. So I think, all right. I could sit here and watch an alligator hunt down this dog, or I'll get in and pull the dog out. And if that's where it triggers, you know, and you know, when you're young, you think you can do things. Uh, I think, uh, so I'm like, all right, I take, off, take out my phone, I take off my shoes, uh, I start lowering myself into the water, and I get the dog. But then I've got a problem. And the problem is, now I've got a four-foot wall to climb up with the dog in my hand and alligator somewhere. I don't know where. So the... Um, Eventually, I'm sitting there for like probably five minutes, you know, staring around. I am ready, by the way, to chuck the dog at the alligator. Um, I am, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to fight off the alligator. I'm like, if I hand you the dog, will you leave me alone? Um, her grandfather gets there and looks down and is like, hey, you want some help? And I was like, yes. Um, I hand him the dog. And then I can use my monkey arms to climb out. Um, and then basically from then on, I was accepted into the family. Um, and so it was totally worth it. Uh, and it leads to this awesome story. No alligators showed up that time, but we did see them around the lake, and they did eat somebody else's dog. <laughs> Ornithians. These are the beaked dinosaurs, and they have bird-like hips. Then you have the Cerisians, and they have lizard-like hips. And that's all you will ever need to know about either of them. Basically, look at a dinosaur and be like, looks like you got some bird-like hips there. You're an ornith Ornithian. Speaking about birds, um, birds have wings. Surprise! I'm just gonna, I don't need to tell you much about birds. They're, they're warm-blooded. They've got a very fast heartbeat. They can fly. But uh, what I want to talk to you about is this one specific bird named Cher Ami. Cher Ami won the Distinguished Service Cross because it's, uh, this was during World War I. There was a, um, a platoon that was stuck behind enemy lines. It was being attacked on all sides. It needed support. They couldn't get the, the radio got shot. Basically, the radio was destroyed. They took a homing pigeon. They tied a note to it, and they threw it up in the air. These, the, the soldiers at that point thought, we're going to be saved. As the bird is flying and the soldiers are still watching, it's shot down. Can you imagine being those soldiers who feel like, 
Bird's free, go, bird, be, go, go, go. Oh, there goes all our hopes. They were resigned to die. The bird, Cherami, the carrier pigeon, after being shot, hopped its way, it lost a leg in this, hopped its way back to the, um, the, the headquarters and delivered the message. That allowed, it, 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 was, uh, the, it allowed for reinforcements to arrive and the, um, the pollution to be saved. And that to me is just wild. So um, they ended up giving it a peg leg and I think it lost an eye. I pretty, yeah, it lost an eye as well. Um, they took, this, the platoon took care of that bird for the rest of its life. Um, and then they stuffed it. And it's now um, part of when the bird died, obviously not. They weren't like, we're just going to do this now. Um, they, they now it's um, in the regimental headquarters as a um, remembrance. So there we go. I talked about birds when I talked about reptiles because they're extraordinarily closely related to each other. Um, to the point where it really looks like birds branched off of reptiles. Um, so there we go. Questions or concerns?